to Cloud and Queer, the podcast by SADA for innovative business leaders and technology enthusiasts, where we explore how Google Cloud is transforming the industry and what that means to you. Now, here's your host, Tony Safoyan. So today in our headquarters, we have a very special guest, someone I've known for a long time, Justin Slayton, current CTO of Avenue. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. I've watched uh, some of your episodes and... <laughs> And it's, uh, it's, it's great. It's great content. No, the best content is actual CTOs working at customers in the trenches. And uh, uh, this is the best kind of episode for me to do. I mean, I love talking to our own people. And I, have to- I love talking to Googlers. But I think uh, the ecosystem, I think, wants to hear the most from people like you in your shoes. Oh, thanks. Um, definitely been uh, on boots on the ground for quite a while in, in the cloud. And that sounds weird, boots on the ground in the cloud. But... <laughs> Um, yeah, I've been, you know, using Google for quite a long time, Amazon for quite a long time, Yeah, uh, all the different, uh, very cloud forward. Let's talk about our history together. I think we've known each other since probably 2004, five, six, the Wasserman media days. I think our engagement there was kind of along the Microsoft ecosystem. I, we were not, we didn't really have a Google business back then, 2004, 2005. But then we followed each other in our careers. You've had an amazing trajectory. The last time we worked together, it was at uh, uh, TrueCar, which I think today still remains one of our great success stories. We have it published everywhere, and that was great. And now uh, you're at Avenue. Yep, a, a startup. So I figured this was one of my last shots to do a startup. Yeah, I'm uh, getting up there and you know, my heart can only handle so much, but <laughs> this, it's nice. It's a, it's, it's actually, you hear about the work life balance at startups are, are off, but this is a really, we have a lot of, a lot of really experienced leaders yeah. um, who really know the space and it's really close to my house, which is the first time I've never had a commute. Yeah. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And um, I'm really enjoying it, but it's a, definitely a different ball game. So it's a startup that's like in L.A., actually north of L.A., which is fantastic because we, we hear about all the density in the Bay Area. And like L.A.'s kind of, you know, our reputation is getting up there with like the whole startup scene and how much venture capital is being deployed here, which is great. So your story is, is one of those. And I think literally, if I know where you live, it's like literally in your backyard this time. Yes, it's a uh, six minutes. <laughs> I can't even we're in the in the in the auto insurance space for autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicles. And I drive a Tesla and I was a very early adopter of Teslas, but I yeah. can't even use autopilot on my way to work because the commute is so short. <laughs> I can't do phone calls, but I'm not complaining. <laughs> yeah, no podcast, no phone calls. <laughs> Those are the things I miss about a long commute, but I'd much, much rather have it this way. Yeah. So tell us about uh, Avenue and the current, the current, let's cover that first because sure. just in a little blurb of what you said, that sounded super exciting because we know that whole industry is being transformed like so many traditional industries in light of all the technology revolutions, evolution that's happening. I'll also, like you, we, we also have like, we like cars, you and I, we have that in common. We talk about that a lot, but I was also an early Tesla adopter. Um, so what does Avenue do and, and how is it kind of transforming this traditional space sure i mean what we're doing is we're reinventing auto insurance for autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicles and what's what that means is what our belief is is that as cars get safer insurance has to change rates should go down traditional insurance usually focuses a lot on the driver and the driver's behavior but as your vehicle gets uh more safe you should pay less in premium that wasn't my experience when I when I got a Tesla first. That's um, right. Uh, the, I got a, one of the first one thousand Teslas made. Yeah. And I went to go get a a, a quote, and it was, it was ridiculous. Was, yeah. I, I I just didn't even know what to do because yeah. it was. I think it was as much, if not more, than my lease payment. Yeah. And so, um, I know that that's you know Elon talks about it about bringing down rates because he wants the cost of ownership to be extremely low. So right. we're doing things. Um, and it's not just focused around Teslas, but we are focused on on cars with this level two autonomy, which Tesla's autopilot is obviously one of the most forward ones mm-hmm. out in the media. And um, but also cars that have autonomous safety features. So level one. Uh, one second. Yep. Can you um, change that screen? Oh, yeah, look at that. 
Yeah, I mean, it's nothing else that's good. I think over time we'll just All right. go into okay. screensaver mode. It says like you're... Um... I don't, there's nothing confidential in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, just, I'm just going to hide this. Okay. okay. You can just pick up where you're. Okay, let me. Okay. Um, so, one sec. Let me gather my thoughts. Yeah. Talking about level one, level okay. two. Okay, there you go. So, a lot of cars these days have things like rear collision avoidance, and you know, you hear the beeps and the, the automatic braking. All those things reduce accidents, and we're focused a lot on making the insurance more affordable for vehicles that are actually safer on the road. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I think there was a period where Tesla was kind of allowing the ability for people to self-insure through Tesla because the traditional market just didn't have the right calculus around what it should cost. And it was being, I think, prohibitive to people's ability to buy Teslas. Exactly. Yeah. Elon Musk talked about it on the latest earnings call. Um, Tesla started an insurance company or they, they started selling insurance in California and it is too low or the cost of ownership. It's yeah. just, it shouldn't be half of the cost of your lease payment or the totally. cost of your lease payment. It just needs to be more affordable and anything they can do to get, cost of ownership down for these autonomous vehicles will get more and more people into them. Yeah. And, you know, insurance is a complicated business, highly regulated. It's state by state. Like not every car manufacturer is going to go on this journey of being also an insurer, right? That's where, you know, your avenue plays a significant role, hopefully in the future. And we talk about this a lot, like just cloud and technology and what I'm not only me, but what we're generally calling like the fourth industrial revolution, which autonomous driving definitely falls within, is absolutely challenging the traditional business models. And any every traditional in industry, insurance included, has been around forever, is is completely being flipped on flipped on its head. And it's like going to be a bunch of startups like Avenue going in to disrupt the space. And the existential threat is to their traditional insurers, like how are they going to respond? Yeah, they. I mean, insurance has been around forever. forever. It's a huge, huge market. Auto insurance alone, I think, is over two hundred fifty billion a year in, in premiums. Everybody that has a vehicle has to have it. It's the law. And auto insurance companies don't. You know, they're not as technology forward as as you would expect. But it's because the model works, and yeah. and it's been happening for a long time. So yes, it's it's ripe. For disruption, but at the same time, you know, there's like you said, it's a, it's a heavily regulated environment. Um, the way a lot of auto insurance companies grow is by they they, they definitely keep a tap on what's going on in, in the in in the environment and and try to adopt as much of the third party technology as possible. Yeah. Um, but like you said, I, I mean, with this industrial with this fourth industrial revolution. Liability is, is sat on the driver and the drivers generally. Right. And and what happens when the vehicle is driving itself or the software that was made by the manufacturer is driving the vehicle? How does liability change? Yeah. So it's a, it's a it's a huge question and and we're kind of at the forefront of that and we're we're really excited. You've always gravitated towards these um, types of companies. And I think if I think about Wasserman back back when you were there and then you went on to Netflix and uh, True Car, of course, like Netflix, I was like super proud of where <laughs> you landed for Netflix, especially at that time. Yeah, that was life changing. Right. Yeah. I can imagine like they're really pushing the envelope. And now you're kind of in the driver's seat of CTO, you know, transitioning another industry, challenging another industry. Uh, so congrats on all that. Really proud to, to have witnessed all of that uh, progression. I want to go back to True, uh, True Car a little bit because that's when we most recently worked together most closely. Um, and I think together we we implemented uh, G Suite. Um, and let's talk about a little like in terms of how like how the decision was made, what impact it had on, on True Car because we talk about the two elements of like uh, of our just cause and one is around um, uh, just sort of increasing productivity amongst the people, like the cultural impact, productivity impact, and then of course, uh, sort of changing the performance of the company. 
Sure. Um, and there's a there's a slew of things in Google Cloud and other technologies that make those things possible. But let's talk about the first piece with TrueCar. Sure. I, I think that there's two stories, right? There's the one that that the people that were sort of against um, bringing in G Suite, which there's always going to be the you know the supporters and and the sort of later adopters, we'll call them <laughs> the slower adopters. Yeah. But the story they they think is that you know here I came in with this uh, G Suite or Google background and um, d- you know made the decision yeah. this rash decision to yeah. just turn the company upside down <laughs> one day and and change to Google. But that's that's not really the case. It's not how I operate. But um, what what happened is if you kind of look at the threats to the business, I, you know, I've been in security for a long time, going back to my first job when, when security was really, your perimeter was your network and you put firewalls there and you kept the bad guys on the other side of the firewalls and everything was sort of hosted in your environment. Yeah. Um, Like I said, I was very cloud forward and, and started adopting cloud technology as soon as it came out and thinking, Hey, if we can spend, money folk if we can spend the majority of our money doing what's really proprietary and, and an advantage to us and and off load some of the infrastructure etc then then we can really focus on what we're good at and at netflix that was you know that was what we lived by mm-hmm. but um sort of the weakest link in security at this point is your end users it, it's unfortunate there's people that are focused all day every day on how do i get you know, a user to click on something, yeah, get on their computer, yeah, and, and phishing attacks, their address, but phishing so, attacks, social engineering, yeah, social. I mean, some of these things are are just really hard to look out for. And th- even at Netflix, one of the ways of thinking was, okay, it, from from security, we had a, an enormous security team, but we will never spend the amount on security that Google will, and so where we can offload some things to them, a company that's definitely way bigger than we are. Let's do that and, and take advantage of the, the the huge investment they have because they don't want a, a user account gets compromised there. You're talking about all kinds of problems. So yeah, using tough. them as authentication and, and making sure that they're always verifying that the, the person is who they say they are, that's a huge, that's a huge advantage to us and we should leverage that technology. So, um, you know, coming into a place that's that's using a sort of, I'm not gonna trash talk anybody, but just like a third party exchange host that is not really, that's not their focus. They you know, yeah. they get what comes with the the territory and and you know, it's, it's a product. I mean, just being in the cloud doesn't mean that you're secure, yeah. but having an email provider that's locking things down and preventing people from clicking on, on links and, and making sure they are who they say they are, and, and you know, throwing warnings in people's faces is something that you're not going to do as a you know a small security team right. inside of a larger company, yeah. especially with people on the road, et cetera. So there was we, we did a lot of prep work and and kind of user feedback sessions to get people familiar with Google and and um, to get their feedback and how this might change their everyday job. And then we rolled out, but we did it in a very, as, as you know, and you probably remember the story, you guys, you guys came back and said that here's your timeline for, for, uh, implementing G suite, which yeah. is, you know, you guys follow. And I, 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 I very much agree with it. A very, you know, prescribed, prescribed, very approach. prescribed <laughs> approach. And, and it's, and it's done with reason. And a lot yeah. of it is focused on that end yeah. user adoption and training and, and getting them ready. Yes. I asked you to come and cut that in a half or a third or something like that. (laughs) I remember that. You know, (laughs) we had to talk and um, it was because, you know, we saw, we saw how the environment was changing and how the risk was elevating. So the risk was elevating extremely quickly. And if our technology or our capability to, to stop those types of attacks continued flat, we were at a, at a much more elevated risk. Yeah. So we went on a, a really extreme timeline and we got it adopted and we took advantage of the, the protection right away that Google was offering. You know, that's fantastic to hear that security angle so front and center in your kind of decision criteria, decision matrix. There's so much um, emphasis on like the collaboration and the unified communication and uh, 
you know, being on the same platform in an enterprise from where like everybody's graduating from college and high school, like that's what they've, it's the only thing they've known. It's sort of the new productivity paradigm. Uh, we sometimes forget that the security part is as important, maybe more important from a CISO standpoint or CTO standpoint, but it is kind of, it, it's so well architected and so consistently effective. We almost take it for granted, but I don't remember a big G Suite deal that we sold that we didn't have a full security review. So it's definitely right. part of every process and everybody's, I think, highly impressed that they get to benefit from this immense set of human and not human processes that are built into all of Google's infrastructure, Gmail with its, you know, billion and a half users or something like that. And also being like one of the biggest targets in the world. Sure. Like, and then, it, I mean, then you blink and you have another feature. That's that's the other thing. Yeah. It's like things that you're not even thinking yeah. about. They're definitely thinking about. You go and you get a, you know, you read an article or you get a, you read their newsletter and you're like, oh, this feature is coming out. Or yeah. you get onto a trusted tester yeah. and like, wow, they were thinking, they're thinking ahead or this is something I asked for and never expected to get, which you just wouldn't see, you know, a, yeah. a non-technical company or, or a uh, Somebody who's, I mean, even if you were deciding to do it yourself, I'm going to host my mail because it's going to be in my hands. You're mm -hmm. just, you're not going to innovate that quickly. That's right. So, you know, again, you, you've had this at least a decade plus now, 15 years that I've known you where you track like very innovative places, working on the edge. And that requires a couple of different things that I want to talk about. One is your leadership style and how you build teams and how you lead teams. I think um, a lot of IT organizations are transforming because the demands being put on them are very different than they are in the past. Uh, and I think everyone, all of our customers, as we talk about various cloud conversations, whether it's GCP or G Suite, they're all realizing that it's a great opportunity if it's executed well, but they have to change as leaders, but also their teams have to evolve. Sure. Yeah. I mean... I saw an interesting change at Netflix because Netflix at, at the time that we brought in G Suite, it was, there were four or five or six people. There was a team dedicated to exchange yeah. administration. Right. And when I came in we said, we're going to go to G Suite at Netflix, those people, their initial thought was, oh great, my job is gone. And we talked and after I got them to stop hating me, um, <laughs> I explained to them, they're actually the most important people in, in this, not just throughout the transition because they understand the, the legacy back end, but they can also be on the, the forefront of, you know they, know, they know what the requirements have been. They know what the uptime has to be. They know how the users interact. And so most of them, I'd say, five out of six, if not six out of six, took the time to kind of learn what they'd be going on to and, and you know, all had really successful careers there. And, you know, that's that's one thing I, I think is it's kind of helping people see whether it's whether it's an end user or, you know, your your technical staff, um, just kind of seeing the other side of the change curve because the change curve is in, inevitable. Like yeah. people are going totally. to people are going to hit the the rock bottom and say, you know, I, I'm helpless. I can't do my job anymore because I'm so un you know unproductive. Everybody's going to go through that. It's like grief, but at the same time, I think a successful leader helps them see the other side of the change curve and get up that hill as quickly as possible. So that's that's sort of what it's about. It's it's helping people see th and and this is th this you know. This could be in auto insurance. This could be in, in anything where you're where you're bringing in major yeah. change. It's just there's a bright side to it, and so getting people up that curve as quickly as possible, I think, is is a strong leader. Yeah, look, a leader that believes in people and believes in their positive intent, that believes in their ability to stretch and do things. I think, um, especially now, that's required more than ever because this premise of like we could just like kind of like throw out the old people and bringing new people that's so far from reality like 
who would let go talented engineers? Exactly. You would never do that. Right. You'd actually want them to stretch and be, you know, and repurpose their, you know, find new meaning in what they do, create, develop new skills. And part of that sort of career pathing and, um, uh, and, and career planning work as leaders, I think, is, is part of what makes people want to work in certain places because they get that kind of uh, embrace. And it's never more evident than going through some sort of a transformation where literally the things that you used to be in charge of are going to disappear. Right. So it's sort of that it's, it's that go time of making making that a reality for them. Yeah, that's huge. And and I also think having having really I don't I don't want to say I hate giving really defined paths, which says like, you know, people people do thrive on on, uh, you know, less ambiguity and, and say, well, if you can give me steps to to become this this position give them to me, prescribe it. Right. And, and the fact of the matter is in, in the enterprise, that's not really the case. And so what you really want to do is, is, you know, give them some, some high level goals and, and get them there, whether it's, you know, learning this new technology. Yeah. Um, but one thing that, that I do think that people tend to focus on is thinking that management is the like that's the path that you have to go yeah. in order to to climb the ladder i don't and agree with that at all it's horrible i mean yeah. i think the saying is you you take your your best engineer and make them a manager you you lose your best engineer and get your worst manager <laughs> and it's not, i mean i'm sure that's not always the case right i was an engineer to yes, start with and yes. I, I hope that i'm a good manager but it's but, not an it shouldn't be an automatic assumption right like it's not what they want oftentimes and it's not even um, best for the company. But we also realized at SADA that a lot of our leaders did come from that. And the ones that have taken out those roles and are, are still here actually are, are thriving for the most part. But, but we just kind of, it was clear to us this year that we haven't done that good of a job in like the management training. It's management enabled. Because like you just, you don't learn that in school. You know, I was just having a conversation with someone on my drive over here because I actually had a commute today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was I was talking with somebody. He's he's been on the job market for quite a while, and he's been going on on interviews and and striking out for one reason or another. Mm-hmm. And he's he's really beaten down, and he kind of shared his last experience with me. But the commonality is that he's not getting any communication back from how he's doing on these interviews. So he's mm. he's kind of like. He'll, he'll get really positive feedback in the interview and we'll talk to you about next steps and then he'll get ghosted. And he was saying, is this because of, you know, technology, because it's easy to ghost people now? And, and I said, I think, I think it's, I think it's a couple of things. I think technology enables that behavior. And I, and I have heard this more and more, mm-hmm. like companies just not being great in the hiring process. Maybe they've got a lot of candidates and they're moving quickly, mm-hmm. but I've always been, if someone interviews with me, on site and and they aren't going to make it or they are going to i like to communicate directly with them and mm-hmm. tell them why or why not and there's some you know i'm en- totally with environmental you. changes i'm or, totally with you this ghosting thing is completely unacceptable when you talk about people experience employee experience that extends to all your interview process exactly every part of that process whether they get hired or not hired they should leave feeling like you are a great company. Exactly. Ghosting you never them knew, is not the way to do you it. You never know who you're going to you're going to run a, you know come across. Maybe you'll be interviewing with that person one day and you'd want the same just like the treat one, you no, know, treat like someone you, how you, you want to I treat think them. you just have to be consistent in your in your philosophy like right. we just don't ghost people. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it's it's but I think leadership training, et cetera, investing in people that are going to be hiring managers that never have before, that those kind of things help and you know, we need a little bit of that, a little bit of, I would call it older, old school mentality that, you know, relationships are, human relationships are really important. Yeah. Even though we have technology, it's, it's really easy to send someone a quick note and say, you know, a quick text and say, hey, uh, we're not going to be be continuing in the interview process, but it it would buy you a lot more maybe to have a, a, a good a good contact with them. And yeah. It's also could be a little bit generational to your point. And, and, and having that training, not only in interviewing, which actually it stands up a lot like that. So, so important to have your hiring managers to, to interview well and understand the importance of their role in a recruitment process. But in every other part of uh, the experience of the people in their teams, 
is, um, you know, we're always trying to like, we want to be the best place to work. I'm sure Avenue wants to be the best place to work. We want people to have an exceptional experience from the first call from our recruitment team to their last day at SADA, right? Um, and, and that a lot of that middle part, if, if the company is doing great and the company has great culture and the company is growing and it's exciting and all of that, uh, then the variable remaining is their manager. Like we really have to optimize for the manager regardless of how well the company is doing otherwise. Correct. Because you're still going to lose people if that person hasn't been trained on how to be a great manager. You're going to lose people on that team. Yeah, there's... There's an interesting, when you're a manager of managers, which I've been a lot, yeah. there's interesting ways to gauge, you know, how, when you're doing skip levels and engaging how that person is um, enjoying their manager or how effective the manager is. And then one of the things I learned was kind of asking them about if they would go work for that person. You know, let's say you got the opportunity yeah. to go in your dream job. Yeah. And then you just find out that that person is now going to be your manager. Mm -hmm. Do you, are you, does that make it more exciting to go to the job? Right. Does it make it um, like, eh, it, do, it doesn't change my opinion. Does it make it like, oh um, yeah, I mean, I really don't want to, but, but now um, the money's but, it good, is my, but it's my so, dream job. So yeah. I'm going to go do it or yeah. like, heck no, I'm not taking that job because yeah. I would never work for that person again. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's an interesting way to gauge that that person we've deployed a new uh coaching platform for all of our managers of managers anybody who has like more than three people reporting to them it's called torch mm -hmm. torch.io it's sort of a, a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching but a lot of it is remote so it's like scalable uh, we're excited about that it's not it's not cheap but i think the roi should be tremendous if it works like 10 percent as well yeah. as it could and then we also started running a broad-based uh, employee NPS oh, yeah. survey monthly yeah. that also tracks like the, the scores do roll up based on manager. So it's important to keep the pulse. Um, but at the end of the day, again, if we believe in like the execution of the company as a whole, and the benefits and all the sort of the hygiene stuff, plus the growth and excitement, uh, the, the weakest link could often be any manager that runs an important team. Well, I, if, it, if it's of any... Um, help to you. Any SADA employee that I've met has been uh, happy to work here. So <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I, I appreciate that. We're, we're getting bigger though. So yeah, we it's, have it's to, hard to scale those things. We, ha we have to get more methodical and management training was just sort of even a blind spot for me and how we've deployed um, people's own evolution in their careers. Like managers need to learn how to be better managers. Like yeah. I need to learn how to be better CEO like every day, right? Um, and then so let's shift over to technology because in, in a lot of your roles, uh, you've had to be the one uh, to help make the important decision of build versus buy. And it's something that all uh, technology leaders uh, are, you know, face. Obviously, we have certain views on it. But how do you determine uh, what to do in each scenario? And what are some specific examples in your several roles that... Um, how you how how you made those decisions? Well, it's really easy, right? If you're the CIO, then you buy, and if you're the CTO, you build. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, it, it's um, you see how, where companies gravitate to when they're when they're doing their pitches. Yeah. But no, it's it's. I mean, like the role the roles are uh, mixed anyway, and it com some companies you yeah. see different different titles, but um, it's it's tough. I mean, number one, I've always led when I'm talking to. a a partner, I call them partners and not vendors. Mm -hmm. Like this is a, this is a huge relationship and we're not going to uh, be in it. If, if you're not a partner, if, we're, if you're just selling a software, it's, it's off the table. Nice. Whether it's a small contract or a big contract because small ones can get big, um, you know, and, and then you have to keep your, your finger on the tap of that as well, because or you, you have to stay engaged and make sure that that relationship continues. So there's nurturing and, and making sure that, that you keep that going. But, you know, at the, in this day and age, you can pretty much build anything. And I've seen it. True. it Netflix is ve was very, you know, build, um, don't use third parties that are smaller than us because... Risk. Yeah, there's, there's a big risk. If the company disappears and you're dependent on them, I, I remember some... Uh, sorry. 
So at, at Netflix, we'd never wanted to use a third party that was smaller than us yeah. because if they disappeared, it would be a, a big impact to our business. And we could build anything. Right. But there was still some times I remember... I remember I went to bat one time with Reed about a, a big thing to implement Google authentication. Mm. Ultimately, we needed to use a partner, uh, some you know, essentially a bridge to the Google authentication. And the partner was smaller than us. They were willing to give us their code base, et cetera. Mm. Just you know, some some different things to assure that even if they disappeared, yeah. which they didn't like having that conversation. But I had to say, sure. hey, if you disappeared. Then what? What would happen? Look, to us? you're Netflix. You can have any kind of conversation <laughs> with any vendor. Yeah. <laughs> it's but, totally fine. <laughs> but ultimately, it was a disagreement, and uh, I, I remember some readisms that came out of that meeting. <laughs> but you know, he he agreed to trust us because that was our area of expertise, and he so he sort of disagreed and committed, mm. and uh, which is you know a great thing in business. It's yeah. just a great CEO and. And it, it ended up being really successful and that company is doing very well now. But um, ultimately, the, the, I remember saying in that conversation, he said, what would it take for you to build this? I said, well, give me a year and 200 engineers and we'll get like 80% of the way yeah. that this company has, yeah. has gotten. And, and it's, it's just at that point, I applied the same mentality about do I want to be in the business of authentication or do I want to be in the business of securing uh, Netflix and its employees and its customers right. and focused on that? And so uh, that goes into every every decision. You could build almost anything, but if you if you put the right evaluation and, and, and way, and there's always a cost involved. Absolutely. But, you know, just make sure you kind of know what where you, what's important to you and what what you should be building. Yeah, no, look, we, we even internally kind of think of it that way, but the way that we, we see our customers express it and really aligns with our philosophy is that it's okay to buy or outsource things that are not strategically important to your ability to execute. You should, you should absolutely build things that are unique to you. You should insource, you should have your own people that are doing things that are the essence of your competitive advantage. Exactly. Where you need to greatly outperform the market. Mm -hmm. but you're not going to greatly outperform the market in like compute, storage, auth authentication, yeah. you know, payroll. Yeah. Like, things Rack, like that. Yeah. Right? You, you, want, you want 20 people racking and stacking servers yeah. or would you rather have those 20 people building software? And that's not, I mean, look, the jobs are still out there for, for people. I mean, it's just shifted. Now you're going to totally. work at AWS or... Or something like that or um you know i've had these conversations with storage providers that i've had long long relationships with back yeah. to you know early yeah. 2000 and and they used to sell me sands and, and and whatnot and hard drives and they were talking about sort of the shift in their careers and it wasn't that hard drive sales were disappearing right they just changed <laughs> their their focus more on um on a few gigantic yeah, I mean, customers. In, Intel is selling a lot of CPUs. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> They're just not going in you know, million little closets. Them. They're right. going in you know, massive, multi-football size data centers at a scale that I think hard to imagine Right. what's happening right now. I think that this uh, uh, period is, is going to be remembered. Uh, you know, Even for people like us who've been doing kind of cloud stuff for 15 plus years, is going to be remembered, I think, as maybe the biggest five to 10 years of our lives with regards to how much change we're going to see. It's almost like we've been preparing the last decade plus like for this moment because a lot of the earnings stuff came out from AWS and Microsoft and Google, et cetera, and all the analysts, uh, you know, there's a lot of data now as far as how we're doing in this, like right now, Q1, you know, 2020. And I think they said like now 8.5% of the known existing it spend is in the cloud up from six percent last year wow. so it's up you know 30 percent or something yeah. but god it's early it is it's it's crazy but yeah i mean the the numbers don't lie and and everybody's focused on it i mean even even when you go to companies that you wouldn't imagine are transforming which 
we'll, we'll circle into that because <laughs> I think you've probably heard my rant on digital transformation, but everybody has some sort of presence at this point. And if yeah. they're not looking at it, then they have to be. And, and it's, it's, it's obviously showing in the numbers. I think all traditional enterprises are facing an existential crisis. And I think for every one of them, there's a hundred like avenue or challenging, you know, the old paradigm. And look, we service both types of customers. Um, and I think for the most part, like the startups are going to do what they're going to do. And they're digital natives. They don't have the technical debt. They don't have, you know, the, the big cultural shifts necessarily that that need to be made. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for a lot of the traditionals to also make it and also transform, like for the betterment of all the jobs and, 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 and how much of an impact like to the economy that they have. Um, so, so we're rooting for them and we work with many of them and we learn often from, you know, the startups, we, we learn, we learn about like their velocity and their, how, how they think. And we try to inject some of that into the enterprise. And for the enterprise, we learn about like their governance and, you know, project management sort of, um, uh, just level of execution around those things, change management and things like that. And we try to obviously bring best of both worlds to our, to our customers, um, but but I think it's it's really early. I think it's super exciting, and I think most of what um, will determine how well some of our clients do is the leadership. Like, what is the technology and line of business leadership in those customers, and how are they willing to execute in these challenging times? Yeah, I, have you coined a term yet for? You know, the digital transformation term drives me nuts because in the in the last, I don't know. 15 years of companies I've been at for sure, they started in a digital age yeah. and there's no digital transformation. These were digital born right. companies. <laughs> now, what I've come into, even at the small, you know, on the, on the smallest end of the spectrum is you started a company that was born in the digital age and they have three to four products to do every little task. So you might have a group, Drives me crazy. you know, using three different CRMs, yes. uh, you know, one group is using this CRM, this one, and then, you know, I, I, I have a term for it, but I'm not going to say it because it's a bad word, but the digital cluster or whatever. <laughs> and, and, and so um, have you guys coined a term for those, those companies? No, I, uh, it, it drives me crazy. We're dealing with even very large enterprise customers who are maybe born in the last 15 years who literally own everything. Yeah. They have bought everything. Three options for video conferencing, four options for like file storage two different authentication things. And part of it is because of M&A, but the other part is like the departmental empowerment of running a credit card. Yeah. And uh, look, I'm very uh, interested in uh, helping customers simplify their um, architecture, but also their uh, security posture. Right. Like I, it's, not, it's not super good to have, to own like, you know, G Suite with, drive and with real sort of authentication through two factor and all of that like but then also like have people with company data running in box right. or something like that like that's really not good yeah it's hard from a security standpoint and a, a budget perspective i mean yeah. you know you're paying for the, video conferencing totally. is, a, is a good example of that like You'll see yeah. you'll see the same company send you uh, three different links depending <laughs> on where it comes from uh, with three different video conference people. But yet, yeah. if you're a G Suite subscriber, you get Meet. Yes. So so yes. Um, it's it's interesting. I've always wanted to like figure out the term for that, but it it drives me nuts. And I know that there's plenty of customers digital that are going through gluttony. Digital, digital gluttony. I don't know. There you go. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yes, we own a Meet. But we want to pay for Zoom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So and also like those people have Skype, and it's yeah, great. Yeah, no, it's it's funny. And then there's this whole I, I, on Twitter. I follow a lot of like startup people and with their products and what they're backing. Like, there's this new category being born of what they call like the Uber luxury SaaS class of products. That's like the superhuman and Notion and these things that are like. Like as if Gmail is not capable of, of doing really good, like mm. zero inbox work mm -hmm. date, like planning and execution. Like you need to own G Suite plus pay thirty dollars a month for another email client on top of yeah. like 
are you kidding me? Yeah, that's that's pretty <laughs> insane too. When you start to look at all the per seat costs of, oh my of ownership for uh, for the ecosystem. It's not like if you buy Superhuman, you don't need Gmail. Right. Like you still need G Suite. <laughs> you still need the platform. <laughs> or like Notion HQ, like by itself, like you still are going to pay for Drive and or Dropbox or something like that. So yeah, this is Louis Vuitton class of SaaS applications. Yeah. <laughs> that's like super... You know the VCs are super into now. But well, I love I love Slack, but my email hasn't disappeared yet. So. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, look, um, actually, I'm super excited. How I've had some of these conversations with Google and with Javier Soltero, who is the new VP of G Suite, who I love and admired for many years. You know, in his Microsoft days and being acquired by Microsoft, he made like the best email app at the time, uh, which was acquired by by Microsoft and is now sort of Outlook Mobile. And uh, we have these conversations, and and um, I think the Google G Suite product ro- roadmap is going to surprise a lot of people yeah. over the next couple of months. Yeah, so we're excited it, about that. They they they're definitely the forefront of innovation, and and like I said, I mean things that you wouldn't even expect. You know, you, you're you're lucky because you you have um, you know you have some some early awareness of it, yeah. but but people people are. It's kind of like it's doing the things that you you haven't even thought of yet and and then those things will just come available totally one day it shows yeah. up and it's great yeah well um what else are you the you know on, on sort of our final thoughts what are you super passionate about right now or excited about going into 2020 so just the short term yeah um, well, I mean, you just saw a lot of announcements come out of CES and, and, uh, obviously I've been focused on, on auto yeah. and, and, and seeing all the cars that are, are going to be enabled with autonomy. And I think, I think a lot of people were surprised because there were some sleepers in there. You, you saw the Sony you, car. Yeah. Well, so yeah. <laughs> it, and they were very clear that that that's a concept yeah. and they're engineers. So, so PowerPoints, et cetera, don't, don't cut it. You have to create something, yeah. but um, no, but there's a lot of players out there, but even thing, you know, like Hyundai and Genesis, you saw the Super Bowl ads. Mm-hmm. Everybody watched the ads. I mean, they were, they were great. And in companies that weren't really making a big fuss about it, because you hear a lot about Tesla and um, they're obviously doing amazing and um, their stock is, oh, oh my God, crazy. But um, but there's the, a lot of the traditional companies are are way ahead or further than you might think. And so I think there's going to be a lot of this level two autonomy out um, this year mm-hmm. that, that you'll, you'll see. Cadillac made a, a really, you know, nice release. And, and I love that car, like the Escalade. It's mm-hmm. what we have to pack our family into because yeah. we have, uh, you know, a lot of kids. Well, three. And um and so, and, you know, we play hockey, so hockey bags. So, so we need that yeah. autonomy to come to, <laughs> to big vehicles and, yeah. and it's, um, and it's happening. So that's, that's near term. You know, I'd love to hear your prediction as well. Like we talked about, we're gearheads. Yeah. We kind of, we love, we love vehicles. Um, I secretly have a, like a gas, a, you know, ice vehicle that, yeah. um, that sort of gets me, uh, gets me that, that you know, smell of gas right. and, and thrill, um, the interesting thing for the long term to me is what happens to those people that are collectors of vehicles and, you know, aren't going to convert them to some sort of autonomy. And that's where you you look at the things that Elon is working on. And are these things going to go on some sort of sled? And, you know, like you get a you might not even get a rev your engine, but at least you get to sit in that that 60s Mustang and and, and feel the steering wheel. But I, I think that in like 30 years, driving might be outlawed. Yeah. That's Could what be. I think. And I think just like you can't take horses on the street, but you can go to the stables. Right. If you want to drive, you got to go to a track. That's, that's an interesting point. And it's... I also think that my daughters will probably, they're seven and going to be nine. I don't think there's going to be any real viable reason to have them own their own car out of the gate. Like right. the reason I have a car is because I like to drive my kids around. I right. like to take them to school and and you know carry stuff but um i don't see any upside to getting my like 16 year old a car that right. they have to themselves drive right whether it's going to be uber or semi-autonomous Thomas, the timing who knows right uber, uber lyft but uh i said that's like i think when my kids were born i said that my you know i don't see my kids ever having a driver's license and 
people are like they thought it was crazy back then but they're like ah yeah i see that so that's my 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 prediction i think elon musk has said, said the same thing i don't think i invented this statement but yeah they're not driving a car will not be legal on the streets well, forever my, my eight-year-old has already claimed my tesla and i <laughs> and i i have the same i have the same thought i don't think you know when he in eight years Number one, you know, he's probably not going to want that vehicle yeah. if he is choosing a vehicle. But number two, I don't think that he'll, I think that that is going to completely change. Might totally. not be getting his, his driver's license because no. the car will be driving him. Yeah. I see no upside to teenagers driving around the streets <laughs> like with cell phones and like this. I don't see any upside for that. So, yeah. hey, the future is exciting. We are fortunate enough to be working on the cusp of it with great customers. So I appreciate your friendship and your partnership uh all through the years and uh i think the best is yet to come yeah same here and and same goes to you i i definitely when i talked about that partnership i keep in in touch with with people that i know um are going to uh help me along no matter where no matter where i go where i end up um I, you know i send people i send people to you all the time yeah. and it's Appreciate it's because that. it's because um you know i i want people to have someone that are invested in their business too and invested in their success and um you guys stay on the forefront of technology and um like you talked about you, you care about your company and your people and and it and it definitely um is seen out there when when you're working with you guys so it's it's great awesome appreciate it yeah thanks thank for you. doing this all right thank you for listening to cloud and clear Check the show notes for links to this week's topics. And don't forget to connect with us on Twitter at Cloud and Clear and our website, sada.com. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app.